today, you are about to witness four women tell their stories. Stories of hurt, pain, rejection, sorrow, grief, sadness, but most importantly, triumph. Let's take a journey into the lives of these women as they share how God can take something ugly and turn it into something beautiful. Beauty for Ashes Ministries presents You Don't Know My Story. I know you've heard of the Proverbs 31 woman, but have you ever heard of the Proverbs 7 and 10 woman? The one the Bible talks about is loud and brash and never content to stay at home? Hmm. That's Robin. Two-Face, seductress, tempter. Ladies, you better watch your man because she's coming for him. <laughs> Watch Robin as she wiggles her way through life as if no one sees her. I am Robin Carmichael and this is my story. Well, Robin Carmichael now versus who I was then are totally different. I um, am a worldwide known attorney um, I have been practicing in my law, law firm for, I want to say about 10, 10 years now. Um, I was made partner about three years into my practice. Um, and so it's been great now, um, but back the old Robin, <laughs> she was a mess. I realized when I was deviating from God's plan for my life when all hell broke loose in a relationship that I was in um, and <laughs> with a married man. Robin, what, what the hell? What, how did you get here? What did, what did you do along the way to, to end up with a married man? You could, you could have any man you wanted, but you decided to be with a married man. I couldn't let him go.
that's when I knew God wasn't, he wasn't in the forefront. Um, I started, you know, losing a, a, a lot. And um, I, well, my focus was on him and everything was about him and, you know, so. What kind of things was I losing? I was, my mind. I lost, I literally lost my mind. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Um, I had started losing a lot of my, you know, uh, cases at work because I wasn't focusing and it was, it just, it became really bad for me. I'm sorry. Um, my relationship with my dad was not existing. I didn't have one. Um, not because I didn't want a relationship with him, it's just his life didn't involve me. So, <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm struggling with that question. You know, I always wanted to be daddy's little girl. And um, it was tough growing up without my dad. I didn't really know how to give or receive love from a man because I didn't have that role model or that male to look up to or to that guide, you know. I didn't have a man to tell me that he loved me genuinely. So at a young age, I was looking for that. And I found it from whoever would give it to me. So my body was just being used by whoever told me they loved me. Every man in my life has always left. And so I just remember laying on the floor where he left me. And I just, I just said, God, if you could just. <laughs> if you could just help me just get up. It changed my life. And I'll never forget that he took me to a scripture that I had read a long, long time ago. It had to be like a few years before. And it was, I can't remember the scripture exactly, but I just heard the words Talitha Kumi, which means, girl, get up. And I promised myself that day that I would give my life to a man that will love me unconditionally. And that man was Jesus. His name was Jesus. I gave my life to God because that is, at the time, I had nothing else to lose. And when I did, it, it changed my life for the better. For the better. <laughs> Let's meet Simone. She's a woman that many of you may be able to relate to. You see, she gives an account of life's choices that led her down a path to bondage. But her story doesn't end there. You see, God took that story and wrote another chapter. Let's see how she danced her way from bondage to breakthrough.
My name is Simone McDaniels. I'm 41 years old. I am a single woman. I don't have any children. I've never been married and I am a dance instructor. You know, dancing is one of my greatest passions. It really just takes me to a place where I'm able to just be free, you know, just free to be me. And it's just a place where I let out all of my frustrations, like everything I've dealt with for the day or for the week. I usually just go out in my backyard and I just release through dancing. So the way that I got into dancing was I was about five years old and I remember my dad used to take me to recitals and he would always take me to like, like musicals and I would see all of the fancy uh, clothing and the costumes and all of the dancers on stage and it was just something that I just would get lost in that place and it would just be like it was just me and the dancers on stage. And so I would come home and I would try to imitate what they were doing and so I just develop, developed a love for it at that moment. And ever since, it has been going on. Hmm. How did I meet Sarita? Wow. <sighs> so, I do a dance class um, in my, my neighborhood. And I invite everybody out. I usually put out flyers and things like that. And so, she actually joined one of my classes. I didn't know her, I had never seen her before, but there was just this connection between us. And it was funny that she would take my class because she, she wasn't a dancer. But, you know, I basically took her hand and I, you know, gave her personal lessons. And we just became very, very close. Wow, you know, we, we had an amazing friendship. I mean, we began to share deep secrets. I mean, I was able to tell her things I had never told anyone. And she was able to do the same for me. And so we became very close and we connected in a way that we had not connected with anyone else. And so it just, it was just something that just really developed. And it, and it really became more than a friendship. And, um, you know, before, before I knew it, we were entangled. bring up my Aunt Janice right now. Oh, Aunt Janice, she really changed the trajectory of my life. As a little girl, my mom would allow her to babysit me. And she would lay me in the bed and I, I was a little girl. I didn't really understand what was happening, but she would touch me. She would touch me in places that just, now I, I know they weren't appropriate. But I began to like it. I, 
and it started when I was about six and a half. Um, and it just developed all the way up to my adulthood. We began, you know, doing things, and even though I knew it was wrong, a part of me didn't want it to stop. But you know, I guess what they say, hurt people hurt people. And maybe Aunt Janice was dealing with some things. Oh, oh goodness. Yeah, so that's, that's Aunt Janice. You know, I just got tired just get tired of of the pain like knowing that you know the lifestyle that I was living was not pleasing to God and I really love him my, my mom introduced me to God at a young age but it's like I was just caught up in another world you know dating a woman but I got tired of feeling like I was not in the will of God. And so one day out in my backyard, I just began to dance and it was raining and I was dancing in the rain and I was just asking God to let his rain fall fresh on me because I just wanted to be cleansed. And at that moment, at that moment, God, he reached down and he rescued me. And I promised him that I would serve him. I would serve him for the rest of my days. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? <laughs> they say beauty is only skin deep. Well, in those cases, we put on makeup to hide the flaws, to cover up the blemishes, to make us into someone that we're not. Let's meet Sarita. She wears a lot of makeup. But watch what happens when that makeup gets washed away. My name is Sarita Washington, and this is my story. I'm a former model I've uh, modeled for very large agencies in my career. I've been on the front cover of Jet Magazine, of Essence Magazine. Um, I was a wife up until a few years ago. My husband died suddenly of a heart attack. I was also a mother, and I later lost my son to a tragic accident. It was on my watch. And I must admit, I feel totally responsible for the death of my son. Now, I'm just trying to find myself and find my way back to me. 
That's my story in a nutshell. I was out doing the shoot in LA and uh, I got the call about my husband. He was being rushed to the hospital and cardiac arrest. I couldn't get on a flight fast enough. He was gone by the time I got there. I still struggle because I felt like there was no closure and I didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye. I was supposed to be there. I was his wife, his helpmate, but I couldn't help him with this situation. I felt totally helpless. <sighs> My husband was everything. He was a great father, a wonderful provider. He was indeed my best friend. So, to say the least, life has been hard. <sighs> Being a single mom, it was the, sh the hardest role that I had to play, especially after being a wife that had to do very minimum for our son. I mean, my husband was, he took him to every sports game. Uh, he took him to get his hair cut and you know they 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 spent a lot of time together especially with the the work that I do and the traveling and everything so um, on that day my son he, he just wanted my attention you know I was always so busy running around going to auditions and things and a lot of times I had to take him with me because my role had changed I was a single mom on this one particular day, he was so upset with me that I had taken so long with this audition and he was hungry, so I decided to treat him to a McDonald's. He loved McDonald's, so I'd get him a happy meal and he'd be happy again, right? We got home and I received a big call. I was excited about the audition that I had just did and they, they, they wanted me, they wanted me now and it, it wasn't even a couple of hours later that they called me to offer me the opportunity and I was so excited and he just wanted to go outside to, to play. Me being busy as usual, I told him just go ahead, go. He went outside to play and I, I heard the basketball, you know, bouncing. So I knew he was okay. He was right outside in the driveway. And A few moments later, a loud sound, a crash. And I kept going. It hit my baby and it kept going. What kind of monster does that to a child? little boy laying in a pool of blood and it could have been prevented if he had a, just had my time he just needed my time and I wasn't I failed him I failed him miserably he, he died before he can even get to the hospital I don't think I can ever forgive myself for that. I don't 
think I'll ever fully recover from that. Celeste, a product of deception. We all know what deception is, right? That's when the enemy comes in to deceive, to pull you away from what God has ordained for you. What else does he do? He hoodwinks you. He bamboozles you. And he leaves you sucked high and dry. And before you know it, you don't even recognize yourself. Let's listen to this story. Hello, my name is Celeste. I am a pastor's wife. Let me rephrase that, I am an ex-pastor's wife. Being a pastor's wife um, is quite interesting. It has its good and it has its bad. Um, you have to remember being a pastor's wife, you have to do everything correctly. Um, you're an example for other women and young women being a wife of a pastor. I also have to be the perfect mother for my children. My children can't even afford to make mistakes. So it's not a celebrity lifestyle where the lights are all on you, but it's still a certain kind of light that comes with being a pastor's wife. Um, a lot of people are watching everything your husband does every move that he makes. They're paying attention to the way our marriage operates. So, it's not easy at all. I do love the Lord, so he is my first priority, which makes being a pastor wife very exciting. I also like spreading the word of the Lord to others. But it's those dark days and the behind the pew and from being in front of the church is where it gets deep for me. Can I ask you something? What happened? What changed? It doesn't change. It's just you. I've been the same. After church, I got my kids and I went home. It was a really hot day, really hot outside. When I opened the door, it was really weird looking inside. Very clean, I would say. My husband doesn't clean the house, I do. I take care of the house. But it was very, very neat. So neat, it looked like things were missing. Okay? So my, um, daughter went to go take a shower and my son he went to go make himself a snack my son said mom the lights won't come on I can't get the microwave to work 
So I, I went to go see what was going on and I didn't make a big deal of it. I just kept playing with the different switches in the house to see what was wrong with the lights. Then my daughter was in the bathroom screaming in the shower talking about, Mom, I cannot get the water to get warm. The hot water won't come on. And I'm just like, this all doesn't make any sense. I'm the one to take care of the bills and I'm usually very good at making sure things are done on time. So I went to go look for my husband and I went and looked in my room. I'm calling out his name. He's nowhere to be found. I looked in the closet and the closet was cleaned out. So I'm like, wow, like where did he go? So I checked my bank account because I wanted to see if I didn't pay the bills right or something. And I found out my bank account was wiped out. And he knew that he was the person who was in control of my finances. He gave me a certain allowance because he wanted to have a certain kind of control over me. And he took everything from me, everything from my children. He didn't care about nothing about their and their well-being because whatever was between me and him, it could have stayed between me and him. But it affected our family as well. So. That was the day that, that things changed for me. I, I thought I would never be the same after that. Like they say, <sighs> pay attention to the signs. Did I see the signs? Yes, I did. I think that everybody sees the signs. We just decide to ignore them. The way that he treated his mother was a sign. He had no respect for how he wanted to talk to her. And his temper was concerning. But I'm thinking, you know, that's just him. You know, I can probably talk him out of that or calm him down, but that was who he was. And people are who they are when they're dating you. They're gonna get worse when they marry you. I saw the signs, I ignored every last one of them. If I could do it all again, I, I would, I think. But at the same time, I'm, everything that happens, happens for a reason. Advice I can give other pastor wives if they were in the same situation. First off, I want you to make sure you are ready spiritually, emotionally, and physically and mentally to be a pastor's wife. It's not all glitz and glamour. So many women are doting over your husband. Um, the devil is working much harder in that union. I would tell them to first make sure that that's something they want to deal with. The more that God is in it, the more the devil is trying to take it and pull it apart. Um, they would also probably should pray together more. Me and my husband had prayed together enough. The most we prayed was probably at the church together. Um, I would also say that don't allow your husband to have control of everything. Have your own money. Have your own say-so in your household. I'm not saying don't submit. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying have some things of your own. What is different now that wasn't present before. What's different now is that I have a newfound love for myself. I thought my husband's love was enough. I thought that we were going to get through everything because we both had a foundation in Christ. A lot of things that I felt and I dreamed and I thought was just not what it was. And unfortunately, we wasn't strong enough as a union to get through it all. And today I am different. 
Today I am grateful that God had so much favor over me that he was able to get me out of something I thought I couldn't get out of. I thought that that was the end for me. I had to stay faithful. I was embarrassed by the church. I couldn't go step another day in that church because I didn't want people to look at me and think that I couldn't keep my household together. I didn't want people to look at me and wonder, was it me that was the problem? I did everything I could do. I thought I was being the best wife. I took care of him in every possible way that I could and that still was not good enough for him. And also today I have peace. I have wisdom. I have understanding. And my children are doing absolutely amazing. So I am happy now. And I'm so thankful that I have a God that is so faithful even when your husband is. Yes, I have made an empowerment group for women such as myself because I created it because I needed somewhere to go and some people to talk to and some people to be able to relate to the things that I was going through and I had nobody. I had nobody to talk to. He told me if I talked to the church or the pastors, he was going to leave me. You see, with me being quiet, he still left. So that didn't even matter. So I decided that I didn't want to see any more women such as myself going through anything like that alone. This thing can hurt you. This thing can cause you to want to kill yourself. This thing can cause you to fail, on, fail your children. You have to find somewhere where you can come to your grips with reality and, and, and dive into your faith. And so I made this empowerment group for all women of all races, all religions that are going through things that they cannot discuss with nobody, but it's safe to discuss it with me. It's safe to discuss it because I also have Christ involved in this group. So that's exactly why I made this group. And it's working out just great. And I'm excited about the impact that we are having on other women. In our society, women have suffered depreciation. Our character has been depreciated. Our value, our spirit, and even our body have been depreciated. Women, we've adopted and we've adapted to the lies that's spoken about us, to the lies that's written about us, and to the propaganda that's been spoken against us. We have been historically viewed and undervalued. We have been identified as sexual objects, our bodies mishandled and mistreated. We have been abused. We've suffered physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. We have been objects of control and domination. Washington Irving, he penned a quote. It says, there is in every true woman's heart a spark of heavenly fire, which lies dormant in the broad daylight of prosperity, but which kindles and beams and blazes in the dark hour of adversity. Maybe you, like many of us, have been treated and handled like Tamar. Tamar, raped, body, abused. Maybe you're like Hagar. Maybe you've been a single parent and you've been left to raise your children alone. Maybe you're like the widow and maybe you suffered lack and provision. Maybe you've been like Leah and you've been undervalued, underappreciated, and lacked love. Maybe you've been like Naomi. Maybe you have suffered grief. Maybe you have gone through bereavement because of loved ones. 
Maybe you may be like Rahab. Maybe you have fornicated. Maybe you have abused yourself physically. Maybe you have gone into some places that you didn't want to be in. Maybe you have been like Abigail. Maybe you've made some mistakes in relationships. You've connected and made covenant with wrong people. Maybe you've been like Hannah. Maybe there was some parts of you that devalued yourself when you couldn't give birth, when you couldn't handle and your body could not bring forth life. Maybe you've suffered and maybe you've gone through abortion. Maybe you've gone through miscarriages. Maybe you've been like Esther and maybe you felt the weight of burden and responsibility for so many others besides yourself. And maybe you've been like Deborah. <laughs> maybe you've been a woman in leadership when women in leadership was not really valued. Maybe you've carried that weight and maybe you've gone through it no matter who you are and no matter what your journey has been. Be like Washington has declared, a woman on fire. Let that fire that now has brewed in you in the darkness, in your troubles and in your pain, don't let the fire go out. No matter what it is that you have come through, no matter what it is that you have taken hurdles over, you are here and you have made it. Your story is a story of value, a story of victory, a story of triumph. Your story is a story of a woman on fire. In the darkness, you survived. And now in the light, now your victory, your victory story shall be told. Let it be said, no matter what it is that you have gone through, take now with you Romans 8 that says, who is he that condemneth? No one. Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again? Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No, you've been through that. Shall distress? No, you made it through that. Shall persecution? Absolutely not. You pressed through that. Will famine? Will nakedness? Will peril or sword? Absolutely not. You pressed through that. As it is written, for thy sake we were killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors. Come on and thank God that you are more than a conqueror. You are a conqueror through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, come on and get persuaded. I am persuaded that neither death ha, nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any powers that come against you, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today, we celebrate women on fire. You made it and you come through it all. So now lift up your hands and give God glory and give him a victory praise. Hello, we're on the set of You Don't Know My Story with our founder, visionary, and CEO, Roz D. Harrison, surrounded by the ladies as we reunite to celebrate the victories of their trials, tribulations, and most importantly, their triumphs. We have Sarita, Celeste, Robin, and Simone. Let's enjoy as we listen to our founder, Roz Harrison, share the heart of the ministry behind You Don't Know My Story. Hi, my name is Roz Harrison, and I am the founder of Beauty for Ashes Ministry, the visionary behind you Don't Know My Story, Women's Empowerment Summit. When God gave me this vision six years ago, he gave me precise instructions. And one of those was that I would create a safe haven where women can come and be empowered and feel safe enough to share their stories of trial and tribulation without the judgment of others. Over six years, we have seen hundreds of women come and feel the sisterhood and strength of many women who have pushed them closer to their vision and their destiny in Christ Jesus. There are women like Robin, Simone, Celeste, and Sarita 
who God has delivered, have set free from their past, and now they're walking in victory. So I thank God for you don't know my story. Thank you for tuning in, and I pray that something was said that would empower you and encourage you to keep walking. I feel like it's a lot better 